think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, all right, so this is Elevating Front-End Excellence, a corporate journey with Figma and Storybook. Um, it's not really a case study. Uh, it's more of a discussion about the types of things we're doing with Figma and Storybook um, with some anecdotes to you know, actual work we're doing uh, in production. Um, so, Um, this was going to be a co-presentation -pre between myself. I'm Sarah Thrasher from Digital Polygon. I'm a front-end architect, and I've been doing uh, primarily Drupal front-end since about 2008. So I've worked with uh, <laughs> Drupal 10, Drupal 9, Drupal 8, Drupal 7, Drupal 6, and a little bit of Drupal 5. I basically started when everybody was like, should we do it in 5 or 6? <laughs> so all of this stuff about 7 still hanging around is pretty familiar. Um, <clears throat> Rodney Espinosa uh, is a UI expert and front-end developer at World Connect. Um, that's the project that we're primarily referencing here. Uh, he does Angular and also UI, UX, design and engineering. Um, and basically, uh, we form kind of a design ops sort of a thing on this project. Um, and I will never forgive him for forcing me to pretend to be a Figma expert in front of a live crowd. <laughs> but he's really awesome at what he does, and it's too bad that he couldn't be here. <coughs> okay, so that's Rodney. Um, like I was saying, he's a really awesome designer, and he is very technical. Um, so I think that that helps a lot with this type of work. Um, and there's a larger UX team that he's the primary interface for, so he's uh, partially on our project, partially on a few other projects I'm not involved with. Uh, it's mostly the Drupal website. And then he also interfaces with uh, the UX team at large and they have kind of like a design oversight uh, kind of thing over several other teams that uh, run Angular apps and some things like iOS uh, applications and other. Um, and then this is me. I don't actually remember <laughs> which DrupalCon this one is from. Uh, like I was saying, I've been doing Drupal since 2008 and mostly do theming. Um, okay. So what is front-end excellence? Uh, primarily it's a front-end that people are actually willing to use that makes it into production uh, that you can extend and maintain without being frustrated and having lots of regressions and breakages uh, and that is also performant. Um, so <coughs> when we first started on this project, the, the project initially had been a Drupal 7 site uh, and kind of a complex Drupal 7 site. Uh, they used domain access, so it was actually several sites crammed into one. There was multiple themes. There was all kinds of stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> I'm not too familiar with what they were using uh, before we started getting onto Figma, but I think it was mostly Sketch uh, and then a little bit of InVision for prototyping and presenting to stakeholders. Um, and there was a branding PDF floating around somewhere that occasionally you would get sent if somebody thought a color was wrong. <laughs> and then on the Drupal side, um, there was still a Drupal 7 site two or three years ago when we started, uh, and then there was a Drupal 8 site that had had a migration, and a lot of the stuff from Drupal 7 just kind of schlepped into it. <laughs> so that includes like a lot of front end that wasn't actually being used anywhere, uh, a certain amount of images that got pulled into the files directory that actually caused some file length uh, problems with image styles, that was fun. Um, and then like a lot of just plain inconsistency and people didn't really know where to find what they wanted. Um, we were using paragraphs and a lot of people didn't know which one looked like what and how it was supposed to work. Some of them were broken. <laughs> like uh, you would try to like use a certain feature and then suddenly the whole page just kabloom. <laughs> so, you know, that's not ideal. Um, <clears throat> so the team was basically pulled together to try to remedy a lot of that and then also with a huge focus on uh, performance uh, compliance with like uh, accessibility standards and then also with stuff like GDPR. Um, and then also to sort of standardize the designs around an actual design system that represented the company branding as a whole. Uh, <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, they completely abandoned uh, Sketch and Envision for Figma. Um, Figma is a web-based design tool. People use it for all kinds of stuff, like wireframing, taking notes. You can use it for slides apparently. <laughs> I thought about that later, um, <clears throat> and other things. And then uh, design tokens was something that Rodney and I were both kind of separately interested in, <laughs> um, that we collabed on quite heavily. Um, 
And then also, uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the components in the front end were actually componentized, discrete, and that the ones that we were using were actually good looking and used by uh, things on the site, and that they were not confusing to the editors, and that they didn't occasionally blow up a page if you check the wrong box. <laughs> Um, so, a lot of the uh, tool set and focus that we had here was on uh, making sure that de designers and developers were using the same language, looking at the same set of tools, and had like a shared point of reference for all the things that we had going on. And um, in particular, design tokens really follows through on those points. Um, I will go more into depth about why exactly that was, but um, <coughs> we weren't actually starting from the worst point for a lot of this. Um, the fact that there was a style guide and corporate branding really helps. Um, the existing theme did actually already have a pattern lab install in it, and everything was split into separate components, even though um, they weren't always filled out in pattern lab. Sometimes you would go look at the thing and there wasn't actually an example. There was just like a stub for it. And I think the reason for that was um, <clears throat> the theme that they had picked initially had a component generation tool built into it. So uh, pattern lab was already in there. It helped to get components generated, and that gives you like a little stub CSS file and twig files. Um, so it was useful to get things started, but then since nobody was really looking at pattern lab except the developers, it got kind of like no man's land. <laughs> there, was, there was even um, a GitHub pages version of it that had a completely manual deploy process. And I think nobody ever onboarded anyone about it, so they just stopped. <laughs> so when I was looking at it, it didn't match anything. In, if you ran Pattern Lab locally, it didn't match anything, like whatsoever. So like they, they had done it maybe for like a year, and then like somebody forgot. <laughs> and since it wasn't part of the build, it just sort of fell behind. And since nobody knew about it, it wasn't like a point of reference for the team. It was just sort of a thing that the front-end developers were interested in and nobody else. Um, <clears throat> On top of that, um, when I first got on, no one could actually run the front end build. Um, I think they got to a point where there was like a solo developer, and at a certain point, keeping up with all this stuff, Drupal was relatively up to date, but Node was something like Node 8. <laughs> so um, I was like the first person on the team who had a Mac M1, and you actually couldn't do anything with Node on it, because even if you're using Docker, it still uses the kernel and Node version 15 plus was the first one that actually supported M1s. So I was like, okay, you, how is the front end getting updated right now? What are you guys doing? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that was basically like our main starting point. We had a lot of good bones, a lot of good ideas, a lot of good intentions, um, and finally an actually large enough team that cared and was willing to like look at this stuff and start updating it and actually using it and talking about it. <clears throat> one of the big issues um, that we especially focused on here was um, there was a, a lot of variables in the theme. Um, SAS uh, allows you to do a lot of really clever stuff that's design system-esque. But the, the variables were clearly something that had been set up and then basically, again, only the front-end developers were aware of them. So there was like a huge amount of colors and I think that every time that somebody saw a color and it was even the slightest bit different, they would add a new color variable. So <laughs> like, you never went back and were like, huh, I think these grays are kind of the same. Why don't we just use the existing one? It's just new variable, new variable, new variable. And um, there was even like a little uh, comment that had like a link to a page where you could put in a hex value, get like a, some kind of random color name, uh, and they'd be consistent. But <clears throat> we weren't finding them useful at all because um, these like randomly generated color names, like the team speaks four or five different languages, right? So like we've got people uh, in South America, we've got people in India, I'm from Maryland, <laughs> and a lot of these didn't mean anything to anybody. It's like, uh, is this gray or pink or green? Like they were cute, but they weren't helpful. Um, and since we had like swatches in a place that was actually generated off of our live stuff, but nobody knew to go look there, um, the designers were just sort of managing their palettes separately on their own. And it was fairly close to what you would see in that branding PDF, but it wasn't identical. Like people were always constantly making like judgment calls about, you know, is this the green? Is this the orange? Is this our blue? Which one of them is our blue? And some of the sites actually had like a slightly different blue, but nobody had actually written down, you know, yeah, this hex value and it's called this 
and everybody uses the same word for it. <laughs> so like, to some people it's like the hex value, to some people it's like eucalyptus, and you know, mostly the greens are the same, but kind of not. Um, so it's small problems, the pages worked, um, people could build with them fairly efficiently, but there was lots of little discrepancies and things that would start to cause more discussion and things going back and forth depending on who was looking at the pages. Like some people care more than others. Uh, and since there wasn't something going like, yes, this is the official branding colors to like back you up aside from that mysterious PDF, there wasn't necessarily a reference to like call people on it when they suggested that you should change a color. So there's just like a lot of little shifty miscommunication, slightly less efficient pieces. Um, <clears throat> and then design files were coming in from various people from like different sources. So sometimes you'd get like a source file, sometimes it's a PDF, you know, they're somewhere in box, maybe it's attached to a ticket, maybe somebody updated it while you were in the middle of doing a ticket. <laughs> you know? And then when somebody reviews it, they're like, this doesn't look like our latest one. Uh, and then you have to go back and you know, put it back in development because there was like a slight design change that wasn't communicated to anybody. Um, so <clears throat> Figma and design tokens, I think solves about 60 or 70% of that. Um, <laughs> this is a, a good quote from Brad Frost. Um, I don't know, um, probably if you're in here, you might be at least roughly familiar with him. He's the guy who wrote the book on atomic design. Um, the pattern lab tooling was based around the atomic design methodology. Even Brad Frost, <laughs> if you go look at his blog now, is uh, suggesting you should use Storybook instead. But um, basically, uh, our tool set and like the complexity we're dealing with uh, keeps evolving and growing and giving us like more concerns that we have to deal with. Um, and in a large organization where there's like lots of different people working separately, sometimes uh, you can go in quite different directions trying to achieve the same ends. Um, <clears throat> so most of what I'm talking about here is hopefully more focused on uh, the concepts than the specific tooling, but um, we did actually spend a lot of time prototyping and testing before we settled on these. And the main reason that we're talking about in particular um, Figma and a plugin that's aimed at Figma called uh, Token Studio is that it actually is more or less the uh, lowest barrier to entry out of the things we tried and fit in the price point and was something that the company was willing to go for because uh, several teams were using it and liking it. Um, and I think like a big portion of that was due to like individual learning and going like, yes, this thing is actually working for us. Um, so like uh, before it was kind of like the official team selection, there was like a lot of personal trying it out and going through the, the learning library and watching videos and uh, showing each other stuff. <clears throat> One of the cool things um, that World Connect does actually is um, there are like regular meetings to like just sort of demo stuff. Uh, so like even if it's like the, the, the IT town hall or there's like an architecture review sort of thing. Sometimes I'll have someone from the UX team just go to show off something like, you know, hey, look what we're doing with tokens. Uh, you know, and here's how this is helpful or um, some of the other Figma features that we were like are the uh, component system and like actually managing a design library. So like the fact that the company is willing to put resources and like allow people that time to kind of like play with things um, is, is really fundamental to actually making some kind of progress and improving the workflow. Um, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're using these things because they're working for us, not because we're getting kickbacks or anything like that. And they, they do cost, so that is like one kind of a con. <coughs> um, they cost uh, quite a bit depending on like what, what other thing you're using. It's almost entirely subscription-based and web-based. So web-based is a huge plus, but subscription may not be. Um, okay. So because when you're using tokens, and I'll get into like specifically like showing what they look like in practice. Because you can actually literally share your token set between like your front end, your Figma, stuff like XD, um, there's a few other things that we've looked at. Um, <coughs> your, your stuff gets way more consistent because you're literally working off exactly the same set of choices. It's not kind of like, it's not something somebody had to manually update to match. It's like literally getting pulled from the same decision point. So there's a single source of truth for like what are your colors? And what are they called? <clears throat> so 
This is like a little screenshot. This is actually uh, the Token Studio. Um, so this is just like a, a little snippet. Um, a lot of the stuff that we did in Figma um, was heavily inspired by uh, the Emulsify UI kit, which is something that's absolutely worth looking at. Um, but these, <laughs> like sea green here and the uh, black suede and stuff, that's actually like our custom green that used to be called eucalyptus. Um, I'm not sure what exactly caused the UX team to light on sea green, but uh, I guess good vibes. <laughs> um, and then the reason why there's like several under each of those color categories is uh, color steps, which I guess the UX team spends a lot of time arguing about. Um, uh, sometimes you see them going by tens, sometimes by hundreds, sometimes it's like arbitrary numbers, and I keep asking people to explain to me what, what the, the pattern is behind the numbers, and they're like, it's design stuff. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, <clears throat> it's, it's based on like a lot of actual research the UX team was putting into about what worked for them and their branding. And I actually think um, this is kind of like an iterative step. Um, they're working on a different set that's <laughs> got totally different um, steps between the colors. Um, if Rodney was here, I think he'd be able to explain what the reasoning was there, but I don't care as long as my front end can consume it. <laughs> so, um, but it's really neat because once you get this in here, um, there's, there's actually a mechanism to, uh, if you're setting like a fresh file, export um, all of this as JSON and then import it into another file. And you can either do that on the fly uh, if you're doing something um, you know, like a uh, small experiment, or you can have um, actual syncing going on between Figma and your repos. Um, so <laughs> we got like a little bit stuck on some of that on our particular project because um, one of the uh, initiatives to sort of get web in line with the way that the rest of IT works is that we moved from GitHub to Bitbucket and it's also pretty locked down for Bitbucket. And <clears throat> When we first started, uh, Token Studio supports GitLab, GitHub, um, obviously those files, import and export, um, and then like uh, you can do like a read-only thing where you pull things from URLs, but they didn't have any Bitbucket. <laughs> so that a lot of people uh, across the company were like, well, if there's no Bitbucket, it's not gonna work for us. Um, and we were like, crap, <laughs> what are we gonna do? Um, Cause like a lot of our early demo stuff was based around GitHub, and if you've got that kind of integration, uh, you can actually have pull requests generated from whoever's maintaining your Figma files, which is great, especially if, I mean, that might scare some design teams, but <laughs> um, I think if you're getting this complicated, you've got to have at least somebody that's you know, comfortable going into GitHub and generating those. Um, but they are actually in the progress now of like at least having like an alpha Bitbucket integration too. Um, I don't know if we'll wind up actually using it. Right now we're using that read-only URL import method, and it's working. Um, and like also, <clears throat> only one person really needs that kind of access. Like you, you just really with uh, Figma, have a central design system library file that you like make other files off of. And the way that it's set up, uh, it actually syncs back to that master file. So like it, it shares things like uh, libraries, variables, styles, and then also like your component set. And if like edits are made in the parent file, they actually trickle down to the other files. Um, and they've got like a, uh, a pretty good way of like managing who in the team is able to do what. So, um, <clears throat> uh, and it's also, um, since it's like enough of a cloud-based tool, um, you can have SSO manage who's allowed to do what. So you can have somebody who's kind of like um, in charge and can like edit and uh, make changes to the files. And then like if you have developers or um, people who just need to be able to make use of the library stuff, they can have like view um, or like a, I'm not sure exactly what the permission is for dev because I've never really set it up from that end, but you can have developers who are able to look at the files and use the dev mode. This is definitely something you can't do on the free version. Um, but the dev mode actually shows you um, <coughs> component stats and then like a little uh, ability to like export uh, SVGs and some generated CSS that can actually be sort of useful. So, you know, sometimes it's not that great uh, when your tools try to do that sort of thing, but I, I find the Figma stuff actually a pretty good starting point. Um, so, like I was saying, Figma doesn't have uh, built-in token support, but they do have something called Figma variables and Figma styles that um, I think is just recently out of beta. Um, token Studio is a third-party plugin that can actually sync your tokens into the Figma variables. Um, and you can also, if you want to, as a designer, use Token Studio to apply the variables to your design elements, um, or you can 
sync them together with the variables and use those if the designer's more comfortable with it. Um, I don't get in the design team's <laughs> face about how they're doing this. They have chosen to sync the tokens into variables because they would prefer to be using the variables. It's like more familiar. Um, <clears throat> and then I think it works with some other plugins that they're using. Um, <clears throat> XD's thing, I was trying to put together kind of a demo and I couldn't understand where to start. <laughs> so if you're, if you're in the Adobe ecosystem, there may be a reason why they were trying to acquire Figma. <laughs> uh, but uh, in theory, they do have um, something called DSP. It's like a, a format that can package together the tokens and other design standards that you could share between different files. Um, it could be really useful. Uh, we don't use Adobe products at all in any of our designer UX workflow, so uh, it's not super interesting to me. But like in theory, like if you want to get started, there are resources out there for doing it in XD. Um, and they do the same thing. Um, when, we, when you receive an XD file, it also has like a web viewer. And what they're showing you of like generated CSS is actually being generated from their equivalent of tokens. So <laughs> if you have a token set, and like maybe some people are on Figma and some people are on XD, in theory you could be working from the same like parent set of tokens across those different tools. Um, so, <coughs> One of the big pieces here was making sure that since these things are paid, uh, everybody's got permission uh, and the right like level of access to actually use these things. Um, so we did spend a lot of time doing a lot of POC work. Like I said, a, a good chunk of it was around how are you gonna sync these things and does it break stuff if I give this random person this file? Can they uh, edit something in a way that like all of our components are now worked? Um, and we've <laughs> gotten to a point where everybody's pretty comfortable with the workflow. Uh, I think the UX team is very comfortable generating like new files and um, I've heard it's kind of difficult if you make a component in like a separate thing and are trying to get it back into the parent one just to make sure everything's still like linked together. Um, I don't do it myself and like they seem to be managing. <laughs> but like I think the, the features where um, when you're in Figma you can actually like mutually edit the same file um, at the same time. You can follow somebody as they try to guide you through something and it shows you like what they're actually looking at and you can like click on it and actually get taken there. You can <clears throat> link to specific frames within it uh, and then like send someone that link and be like, hey, look at this piece. <laughs> and then you can take those uh, like as the designer, convert them directly into a component, uh, start editing properties. Um, so like it's, it's a really neat tool that um, it wasn't that hard to sell people on. Uh, I do keep myself losing access to things like dev mode. <laughs> They're like, well, she hasn't been in here a while, so like, let's turn it off. So, <laughs> um, but that's that's uh, probably fine. Like, um, it's mostly the UX team that needs to be in Figma. Um, okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> none of these uh, things are exactly a push button, um, even if there are features within it that allow you to do a certain amount of exporting. So like I was alluding to, um, there are CSS exports. Uh, some of these actually do HTML <laughs> exports. Uh, some of that's plugin facilitated. Um, uh, there's imports. Uh, I think Rodney was looking into some tools to, uh, rather than like hand create some of the components, like actually read the HTML and like generate them inside of Figma that way to like sort of shorten the timeline, which makes a lot of sense because we do have a lot of things that exist in our design system that are not yet represented within Figma. Um, and we're also spending a lot of time auditing and being like, well, maybe don't bother with this. <laughs> we're gonna kill it. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's an artifact of communication. It definitely facilitates communication, but none of it's a, a push button that like prevents us from talking to each other. Um, I, I think one of the good effects is that um, we spent a lot more time actually in there like looking at the design files together and like asking, you know, why is this name this? You know, what does this do? You know, could you like update this to have, <clears throat> you know, hovers and things like that? And if your team members are all kind of like crossover between front end and design stuff, maybe your front end people will spend some time editing the files. Uh, it kind of just depends on what skill sets and interests you've got <coughs> on your specific team. Um, Due to the fact that they cost and there's like some seat licenses and things like that, uh, you know, like that, that might help if it's just you, <laughs> you know. Um, but 
the, the bit about having to convince people that, yes, we do need the pro version of this, yes, we do need the pro version of this, and then occasionally having to go through things like security reviews uh, and whatnot, that, that can be kind of a bummer. Um, but I think it's absolutely worth uh, trying out these type of tools and convincing people that it is actually gonna save a lot of time and I think also grief. Um, okay. So <laughs> this is the part I'm a little more familiar with than the Figma side. And I do have like a little bit of demo stuff that I will try to get to before I hit the question period. Um, we had an existing theme that, that was using Pattern Lab. So uh, if I was doing this from scratch, I probably would have gone for Emulsify and we would have started like from that. Um, I do think that's in beta, so, um, but like there's an actual like Figma UI kit and starter that you can work with and um, like the build tools work. Um, there's also like a, a few blog posts I've seen out there about uh, integrations between um, uh, just like the Figma and Webpack side of things and like pulling Twig into that. Because um, if, you, if you go look at like the Storybook website, there's an HTML flavor, there's a React flavor, there's an Angular flavor, there's a Vue flavor. There's no like out of the box Twig one. <laughs> but it's not actually that hard to get Twig in there. Um, and there's also, um, I think there's a couple blog posts on Lullabot about the Storybook module. So um, <clears throat> one of the things is if you're starting from an existing project, um, the ones that use either React or HTML, you're using Twig.js. Um, and then I think the Storybook module actually runs Storybook off of Drupal's Twig, um, which is a huge plus probably <laughs> because Twig.js has slight differences between Drupal Twig and what it does. Um, like one thing in particular that I had run into that I don't think is fixed yet uh, is if you've got a bunch of um, classes and you're like doing some sort of like join sort of thing on them and you've got any sort of ternary stuff in there, uh, it starts processing the, uh, the join before it <laughs> does the ternary unless you put parens around it. Um, <laughs> so a lot of uh, core Drupal templates do that. Um, and it works fine if Drupal's rendering it, it does not work fine with Twig.js. Um, so there might be like slight little differences if you're using JavaScript for your Twig versus like having PHP run it. Um, this was actually one of the things about Pattern Lab that made us decide that it was worth switching from Pattern Lab to Storybook. It's, it's not really very well maintained and the Twig that's built into the Twig editions of Pattern Lab you can find out there is Twig 2. So um, there's enough little differences that um, if you were trying to update that to Twig 3, you'd basically be maintaining that yourself, I think, at this point, <laughs> because pretty much everybody's moving to Storybook. So um, <clears throat> it's much better to, I think, stick with the things where you can at least look at other people's projects, go into Slack and ask them how they fixed this, and. Uh, um, maybe contribute back to things if you find specific stuff. I, I actually did go on the Twig.js uh, issue queue and um, at least make a, a reproducible case for my <laughs> ternaries issue. Um, I haven't like checked back or tried to fix it myself, but um, basically I've been just making sure to include parens around ternaries. Um, and there are some tools where you don't have to do that. Like um, the Emulsify has like a companion module that uses a couple methods like add attributes and BEM. So you can just provide it an array and it just works and you can ignore what I was talking about with ternaries, but <laughs> um, it's, it's one of these situations where the fact that everybody in the community is kind of involved in looking at this sort of thing is, is really useful because um, uh, all of the Pattern Lab stuff is sort of getting old, the blog posts are several years old and like Storybook is something that people are actually talking about and actively trying to use in their own projects. Um, <clears throat> so uh, like I was saying, there's uh, a recent like POC sort of thing I saw Mario Hernandez put up that uses Vite instead of Webpack that uh, pulls in Storybook. Um, there's the Emulsify UI kit, there's the Storybook module, and then that also has something called CL Server. And I think it might actually work kind of like the, um, uh, if you've looked at the style guide module, so that you're actually getting like Drupal stuff within different themes within Storybook. So those things would be kind of neat. Um, the reason we went with doing kind of a custom thing was that we were trying to reuse as much of our existing Pattern Lab stuff as possible to like <laughs> kind of keep things lighter. Um, but there's like a lot of neat stuff out there if you're starting from something fresh or just want to play around with it. Um, <clears throat> so tooling <laughs> is why the tokens that are using in Figma actually are making things uh, more efficient uh, when it comes down to the theme. So um, the uh, Token Studio people 
also have this thing called Token Studio Configurator, or like if you want to, you can like find kind of like a working example. But what it does is it takes some JavaScript and some config files, looks at those JSON files that you can export out of Storybook, um, <laughs> sorry, out of uh, Token Studio, and transforms them into whatever your front end needs. So um, in our case, and I think most people here probably, um, we're using CSS properties. Um, Style Dictionary can also output SAS. Um, it can also output uh, CSS and JS, <laughs> you know. Um, so basically whatever you need. Um, if you play with this thing, you can actually uh, do an export of like all the files out of Token Studio, upload them to the configurator, and then look at the change in the output as you play with the settings. So like if you're trying to learn how to use Style Dictionary and configure it, I think this is pretty useful. Um, and this is just like, um, this is a screenshot of Token Studio here. But like, um, <coughs> I wish I got a tab for that one. Um, okay. <coughs> Aside from the stuff that we have in the style guide, um, we've also been putting a big effort into um, actually testing to make sure that what we're changing is uh, not breaking things and that we're improving our performance steadily. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I uh, really enjoyed in the talk that was in this room before lunch um, was that uh, dark mode apparently actually has like a huge impact on your environmental uh, uh, stats uh, on your OLEDs because apparently like black pixels don't, uh, <laughs> don't like light up on OLED. Um, I'm going to take that one back to Rodney because uh, I think it's a little additional ammo for them trying to build a dark mode on the UX team. But um, our, our current stack is basically, we're evaluating things in Lighthouse. Um, we even have Lighthouse built into our CI that generates some files that we can prepare when we're changing things. Uh, the marketing team uses SEMrush, which is, I think, also using Lighthouse to flag performance issues. Um, we have a separate team that's doing stuff in Apple tools to do a visual regression testing. Um, I, I do think that one, um, if our team was a little smaller or I was the one that was doing this, we'd probably use what's built into Storybook um, because uh, Storybook 8 actually allows some visual regression testing specifically on the stories within Storybook, but Apple Tools is um, basically like a cloud-based visual regression testing sort of thing, so it takes snapshots of your pages. You can aim it at Storybook, you can aim it at Drupal, and then it you know diffs so you can catch if there's like visual regressions happening. Um, and then we also do like a lot of uh, stuff within Webpack to let us know when the build files for the SAS and JavaScript are getting too big, um, or any of our like processed background images. Okay. Um, so I put this here, but I do actually have some tabs. I don't see if I can bring up open that actually have some live stuff in here. Um, before I uh, open any of those, does anybody have any like questions about like specific stuff I went over? We just took the build. <laughs> we just yeah. So so yeah, they, they've got they've got a design system in there, kind of like a stub. Um, and like, there's like I talked about four kitchens <laughs> and they're in their booth down there. If you want to like uh, hear like the whole spiel, but like, basically, um, they have a, a. It's pretty common if you're like using Figma to put up like a UI kit for your design system. So basically, what they put out is the Figma UI kit, which you can then clone and like um, start modifying. And like if you if you go look at like um, Material or um, like AWS or like the thing that like, um, they all include like Figma UI kits alongside this stuff now. So it's like a starting point. Um, <clears throat> and theirs is actually matched up with like the tokens that are within the theme. So like if you were to generate like the starter theme, uh, then you can actually like match it up to what is in Figma and it'll be using like the same token set. So since we already had a bunch of existing <clears throat> front end component stuff, we didn't need any of the, the design stuff itself. Um, but we did, since there's like a working build that does like the token conversion, and it was kind of similar to what our existing theme was doing, we used it as a model for um, including Storybook, uh, some of the build commands, um, and then how Twig gets into Storybook. Right, right. So like that's the main that's the main thing that if you're doing this from scratch, it's going to be a pain in the ass. There's um, y you need to figure out how to use Twig templating to output the components, and you need to figure out how you're going to handle JavaScript. Um, so um, they've got uh, something in there that 
kind of like mocks Drupal behaviors. So then if you're actually like loading up uh, behaviors in any of your stories, it works. Um, but like we didn't actually need any of the, the components, but it's a great model for how to set up the files and has the running like build in it. <coughs> Um, so Token Studio, um, if you already have like color variables and spacing variables and things like that, um, you could take something like Emulsify or even they have like an example file and just start manually adding them. Because <laughs> like basically um, what tokens are is um, there's usually like a three tier model in like most design systems where you have kind of your, your primitive elements which is just here's all of our colors, here's like our um, typography, steps, uh, font sizes, like here's our actual font choices, like if you have a primary and a secondary font, here's spacing or things like that. And colors is like a great one to start with. And I think like a lot of people focus on colors because you get like the swatches and like it's obviously a very important part of your branding. But if you actually have like well-named colors, you could just plop them in. Like there's this little button, pick a hex, name it. You might want to spend some time reading up on like the naming schemes. But like uh, there's a lot of, I think it's kind of, paving the cow paths sort of stuff. So like a lot of them are like, you know, color, red, and then like whatever step you're going through. And I think like um, our initial set of colors that we had in the variables didn't have that sort of step thing going on where there's like the tones. But like, um, I think Rodney used something to generate the steps and then tweaked a couple of them. Um, and it's not necessary. You don't need to use steps if you don't want to. You could just have straight up hexes with specific names. So it might be helpful to kind of like translate what you have in variables as directly as possible to start with, just to see how it works out for you. Because um, then you can actually start replacing what you have in SAS with like CSS properties or something like that. And the naming will be pretty straightforward. And like they just work. So let me see if I can. <laughs> yeah. I was so just trying to figure out, I, I had a tab open that I could I actually have it. some. Answer his question. Okay, I'll yeah. yeah. Um, was there somebody? Yeah. So you say you use Rodney's extension for a bit more of a no, no. <laughs> no, or, no. Or I haven't tried it out. It looks neat, though. Okay. So um, does, does, does your setup, does it require any running or is there install? No. Oh, it doesn't? Okay. No, it doesn't. Um, and one of the things that we did that I'm not sure, um, it, it actually runs outside of DDEV, so like we proxy it, so it's like um, you don't need to like install anything on your computer to get the right versions of Node, um, and that like matches it up a little bit better with just CI. But like we basically have it come up on a port on our DDEV, um, and it, it all, library loads and everything. Which so is like it, it doesn't require Drupal, but it does use the HTTP API? It does not. No, we're, using, we're using QuickJS. Oh, it does use QuickJS. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay. That's why I'm having the problem with Turner. Because yeah. I've, I've worked on some of this. Yeah. There's, a, there's another JS extension called Clean. Yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. No, we yeah. don't use that. It's the QuickJS. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, then, yeah, that's kind of the problem with these, like, uh, JavaScript versions of Quig, right? Because like the Quig project in Symphony and it's getting updated, and then like the people who are updating those have to like keep it on par. Well, I, I tell you, <laughs> the Twing guy, you yeah. can find pictures of the Twing guy just yelling at the Quig developers and baby hunting. <laughs> so he, he, he is pretty much on top of complete one to one parity with Quig. So I don't care if it's it. stupid, I just want it to load. You're right. <laughs> I, mean, I kind of care if it's stupid, but like. I don't want to Is this it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. do it here, it'll yeah. do it there. Oh, it look here. oh you, did you mirror it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So this is, this is um, I made this, not Rodney. Please don't hold this against him. <laughs> this is like a really ultra simple. Um, so um, one of the things that I've been looking at um, as kind of like a cool example of how these sort of things can look is um, uh, these aren't strictly tokens. Um, open props is like a, basically the, um, it, 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 it's based on tokens, but like it's a, built library that gives you CSS variables. And I think it's kind of a great example of the front end portion of how it looks after your build is working. Because like, you know, what we're looking at here is actually CSS properties. Um, so like the end goal of like having this all up in your theme and your build is rather than having to get this stuff into SAS, you can just use CSS properties. And um, basically at this point, the only part of that you need to be using in your build is generating this. And you can handwrite these too. <laughs> This isn't like uh, something that needs to go out of a build. Like if you wanted to, you could just pull this in and use it. Um, and this is cool because it has a lot of examples of sort of like how uh, this sort of thing can be organized. 
Um, and they have like examples on the site that you can play with. And a lot of these are links out to, um, like people, you can easily use it in CodePen, you know, and like just try it out and like see how it works. And if you wanted to, you can just use this. That's like the point of it. It's like a good starting point if you are working from scratch uh, and you don't want to try to like reinvent the wheel as far as like design systems. This is meant to be a model you can actually build your front end on. Um, <clears throat> but the reason I'm looking at this is that um, they do actually have a little bit of stuff in here that you can use. And this is actually like the same kind of Figma JSON um, that I'm using in the theme that we have. Um, so what I did here was I created a fresh file and I used Token Studio. And this actually didn't pull in everything that's in Open Properties and I think they have a note that says that these don't all actually work as tokens. Um, but if you go into the settings, you can see that this is actually just the, this is a slightly different URL, but it's that same file that we were looking at right there. Um, and <coughs> I, uh, when you're using this um, URL method instead of importing the JSON files, uh, you can't edit the tokens because they're synced, right? So um, the only thing I've done here is I pulled it in and then I switched over to local document, so now I can edit the tokens. Um, <coughs> so if you were in like a stricter workflow, you would probably leave sync on because people aren't supposed to be constantly editing the set of colors they're working from, that's the whole point. <laughs> you know? So the tokens are coming in like upstream. If you're using something like GitHub sync, it's the same sort of thing. If the main branch is updated with a new set of tokens, Figma is then syncing the files off of there. Um, so this one's just for me to like play with since the new design system isn't something that's out in public. Um, and I wanted to be able to like uh, show you and I also, I'm not allowed to edit the tokens. <laughs> so like, even if I was showing you the real one, the UX team handles that all on their own. I don't touch it, I don't tell them anything. I just put the variables where they're supposed to go. <laughs> um, but uh, basically this is the part that you don't get out of the box with Figma. This is, this is Token Studio, the plugin. Um, and so like if I switch off of settings here, like these are like the literal tokens in the UI. Um, and these already have kind of like the syntax of um, how CSS properties are usually output from something like Style Dictionary, which is a little bit weird. And actually when I try this out in Configurator, it doubles them up. Because <laughs> like um, for like colors, for instance, like here we got gray and then it's gray zero, gray one, gray two. And when I ran it through uh, conf the Configurator, it's like gray, gray three. <laughs> but in a real world scenario, you probably wouldn't have the color prefix on here. You would just have like the set gray, zero, one, two, or gray 100. Or yeah. One of the other uh, places you might have seen this if you've done any government work is USWDS is also using tokens. Like this is, this is very much the way that people who develop design systems are working now. Um, and it's not that difficult to deal with. So this is a two tier version of the three tier system. I just wanted to show this. Um, these tokens are actually mapped to the tokens in the open prop set. So this one, brand blue and brand green here are blue nine and green nine, uh, which I picked arbitrarily. Um, you might also, if you're fully doing like a three tier set, now have sets for each component. Um, and that way, um, it also enables things like within Token Studio for you to have like dark mode or skins. Um, so like that's pretty cool. Um, what I was talking about here is uh, load from file folder or preset. Like if somebody has tokens and <laughs> you wanna play with them, you can just email it to them and they can just load it up into Figma. Uh, if you don't have some sort of like formal thing set up within your, your, your working group, you can, you can just share them and play with them. And you can also like export this out. Um, so um, the one that I was using for the configurators, you go to like multiple files and just export it, you get all these in a zip folder. And then um, this is what the configurator looks like. So if you just go here to upload tokens, um, I already did this and <laughs> here's what I was talking about, see? Rather than uh, gray zero, which I think would be ideal, it's gray, gray zero. But you know, these are the same hex files. So th like the question you had about your SAS variables, <laughs> that would be your SAS variables. And you would wanna like look and make sure that the naming made sense for anybody who was working in the file. Um, it's also neat um, once they're actually applied um, this is the uh, syncing of the token set to um, the variables within Figma. So um, this stuff that's on the side here, I only have this one crappy text style. <laughs> a real design system would have many um, and they would probably have meaningful names like heading and text and things like that. This one's button. 
Um, but these are actually um, applicable to this. So um, this one here is an instance of a component, and this one is the parent component. I don't know if you can see this, but um, the actual component has like a little four diamonds, and then the instances have like a little empty diamond. So um, this is also in this here. I only have the two components because this is sort of like a little toy example. Um, but I have a button and a card that has the button in it. And uh, if I drop the button out here, um, these are all split out as properties, so. Let's see. And then this actually has uh, some of the tokens applied to it. So you can see there that the color is brand green. And nobody has to ask which one is brand green because we've, we've called it out. <laughs> um, and then like, uh, if I, I don't know if I can switch this over to dev mode because, oh yeah, see. <laughs> so this is the free version, I can't show you dev mode. Um, so that's, that's sort of in the like drawbacks sort of thing. Yes, yes, yeah. governance is absolutely the right word. Yeah, um, there is a couple of people within the UX team that have taken charge of you know, what goes into the tokens. Um, we have a set that we're working on that was based on the original pattern library and the theme, but um, they're working on a full set that takes in that into account and then also stuff that the Angular team was working with and making like a single design system that's gonna be official. We're not, we're not using that currently. Um, we do have plans to adopt it, but it's long-term roadmap stuff. Um, I think the UX team was hoping there could just be one storybook that everybody uses, but to do something like that, it would need to be web components based. And um, as excited as that makes me, I think the Angular guys were like, <laughs> um, so we, we might wind up doing it, but I think it's gonna be another round of PSCs and convincing. Um, but I do think it's a good idea. Um, <coughs> the the difference there is like everybody would have to adapt uh, their templates to actually like allow for those and we'd make sure that there weren't like huge performance regressions or something. But it does seem to be the way things are trending. Like, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> at least I'm almost out of time. Um, any other questions? Um, I, this one is just sort of like a random one. So if um, Figma and paying for Figma seems like kind of a pain in the ass and or you don't like going down that road. I haven't actually like played with this a whole lot. Um, Penpot is an open source Figma competitor. Um, they, it's, it's, you can find it on GitHub, you can contribute to it, and apparently you can run it yourself. And it does the same sort of um, <coughs> uh, component structure. And one of the things that I actually found this for was they have a partnership with the Token Studio guys who have the Figma plugin. So like um, they're actually like, going to accept the same sort of format of tokens as Token Studio does, and it's open source. So uh, I'm not necessarily, this isn't like a, I just thought it would be nice to know. It seems kind of neat, and I'm definitely gonna try it out. Um, and like, it does the same sort of thing as Figma, where if you like look for their tutorials, it's actually a file you run in the web interface that you can like walk through and try things out. So it's, it's pretty neat, and I thought for this audience, maybe this would be a cool to know thing. <laughs> um, anyone else? Okay, um, that's all I got then. All right, uh, thanks everybody.